Nas is about to drop an album and he has a line that I really like. He says, my father wasn't a banker, neither was my neighbor when it came to getting paper. Who the hell was going to train us? And that line just resonates with me. Who can we go to? I had no one to show me about taxes. I had no one to show me all the levers. I had no one that, it that could introduce me to people. Those networks were not, are not systemically there for us. So really your show's title, Leaders Create Leaders, yeah. means a lot more than just a cool title for me. Yeah. It means it's real talk. Like yeah, it's you sure. and I yeah. who have paid our own way, creating a business out of giving, letting other people yeah. have that opportunity. New day, new goals, let's own it. And in this episode, I'm excited because we're getting ready to meet up with a serial entrepreneur that, you know, he had his first exit at 21. He just got ranked Forbes 30 under 30 for 2019. He's the host of the new show on Viceland Hustle. But the thing that I respect the most is his mission to invest into 1,000 diverse founders over the next 20 years. He's a huge advocate for the black and brown community, someone I relate to because he comes from an Hispanic background. He's from Harlem and he's the co-founder in a venture firm known as Harlem Capital. He's someone that I just really admire. He's become a dear friend and someone who you guys need to watch. Let's get to it. The untold story of none other than my boy, John Henry. This is dope, man. Thanks, like man. I've always wanted to do a Leaders Create Leaders on a stoop, bro. Welcome like, to Harlem, man. Welcome this up is town. amazing, man. Thank you for inviting us into, you know, basically your neighborhood That's where right. you grew up. I mean, these are your streets. If there's anything that that I could impart on anyone in a small way through content or meeting someone or what have you, it's it's just that that I showed up, you yeah. know, I feel like we as leaders going out there, you know, the responsibility rests squarely on your shoulders. Yeah. And sometimes we're our own worst critics. For and I don't sure. know if you deal with this, but I, you know, sometimes just needlessly beat myself up. Yeah. And that is part us sharpening ourselves to be greater. But in part, I think it's, it's nice when you can sit down with a peer and acknowledge yeah. each other's man efforts yeah you know we're out here and you know whether we get the w or the l we're showing up the beginning of john's story is something i relate to because my mom immigrated here from colombia my grandparents on my both my mom and dad's side came from colombia and italy and for john his parents immigrated here in 1991 because they were going through extreme poverty and then when they got here they landed in harlem and we're going to get into john's part of the story of Really, where did the entrepreneurial spirit come from and how Harlem was the place that really taught him about the street hustle? The most important part of my whole identity really has been coming from immigrant parents. And, you know, my mom and pops came here in 91 and I wasn't yet born. But their story gets me emotional because the way that they came here was not like your traditional we applied for a visa type situation. It was like hey, we're living in poverty. And I have two older siblings that were born outside of the US. And, you know, frankly, there's just way more limited opportunity outside of the US. And my parents are like, yo, we need to do anything possible to make sure we get there. And, you know, my mom came in how she could. My pops came in another way. They came separate times, you know, both endured different challenges and, and you know, my pops has really taught me to be resourceful. So he would make anything, he would do whatever he could to, to get you know, that desired result. So anyway, coming up, my mom and dad worked you know, pretty humble jobs. My pops was a presser and a dry cleaner, and my mom was a custodian. And you know, making below minimum wage, because that's the kind of work that was available to them. Their skills uh, didn't transfer, because you know, my mom didn't go to school. And, my, you know, they didn't know the language, they didn't know anyone here. Can you imagine that? 
you imagine going to a country, you don't know anyone, anything, you don't know the language. The little bit of refuge that we had was that they immigrated uptown. These are my streets that I grew up in. And here you, you get a lot of immigrants from a lot of different places. And so growing up in this melting pot shaped my vision. And I didn't really know that I w what I was growing up in was special until I left it. And I spent a little bit of time in Florida coming up. That's where I did high school. And when I was dropped into Florida, that really was the eye-opening moment for me because I lived in kind of the brokest part of an upper middle class neighborhood. And, you know, these were kids that were getting brand new whips at the age of 16. You know, if they wanted a new hobby, boom, brand new guitar. You're into skateboarding, boom, no problem. You wanted to be a producer, boom, studio. And I'm sitting here like, damn, like I don't even have my own room. I'm sharing my room with two other brothers. And the reason I bring that up is because growing up uptown where everyone's on the same kind of level, you don't really notice it. But when you're put in a situation where you're starkly different than everyone else, that's when you have to confront your upbringing. Yeah. And for me, you know, there were times when I was even, as a young man, resentful with my parents. I didn't know really then what they had been through, but I was just like, damn, why can't I have the new stuff? Why right. can't I have my own room? Why can't I have the cool you house? Didn't, you didn't have the empathy or the respect yet at that age no, to understand what, the, what your parents, what they were going through to put you in this position that you're in today. That's what I'm saying, yeah, exactly. And it wasn't until, you know, I've grown and matured as a young man, and now it's ironic because I look at a lot of my peers that I went to high school with who had the world on a silver platter. Yeah. And because they didn't have to hone those skills and get tough and work yeah. and, you know, and sell and learn how to develop yourself in the, in the zone of discomfort, which yeah. is where all the growth happens. Now, you know, I, I f I'm just thankful for what I came up in. So anyway, to take people back, that was the roots, you know, and there's, there's color there. There's a lot of different stories and stuff, but in a nutshell, on a high level, my tale is that of being hope. I, I came here and my parents had hope that their kids would go on to do great things. So every day I rest with that pressure. And one of the things John says is that he will be defined by his own efforts. And you know, that goes back to the beginning when really his first mentor, his first real breakout was when he started as a doorman. And then we're gonna find out how did it go from being a doorman to then turning into his first exit by the age of 21. Like when was the first turning point in your life that like, okay, nobody's doing anything for me yeah. except myself. Yeah. And like you started to step into, into, that, into your, your path. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's a good question. I think coming up, I come from a family of merchants. So it's entrepreneurial spirit. Like my mom used to sell super soakers in the park on a hot summer day. Right, that's, that's, and, that's amazing. And my mom would cook seafood and sell it out of the back of a Jeep, um, you know, during the summer to all the guys hanging out on the streets. You know, so I grew up understanding resourcefulness, but I still hadn't felt like that was a, I, I didn't know about entrepreneurship on the scale that I know about it now. It wasn't until I was working, I moved back to the city after high school and I was working as a doorman and um, I had the great fortune of having that job. And that job means so much to me because, you know, it's quite literally opening up doors for people help open up doors for me. Like I was, I, there are probably thousands of doormen in the city that just show up, clock in and clock out. But for me, I was like, wow, this is awesome. I get to sit here in this beautiful residential building, expose to a caliber of life that I didn't even know was possible, A, and B, I get to wear a suit. And you know what I'm saying, just greet people and, and, and. Express yourself, I'm sure. I still wasn't looking at it like entrepreneurship. I was looking at it like, man, this is something that if I'm gonna do it, let me do it well. And so it was unlocking the hearts of the people who live there over time because people take a liking to someone who does something with a good attitude. I don't know, you know, I feel like that's in, in us all. You see someone, you're like, man, I, I appreciate this person because of how they do it. They do it with a smile. You know, you warm up to them. And so it was that gradually over time, there was one resident who was like, damn, 
you, what are you doing behind the desk, John? He's like, did you know you could live a life where you can have your own doorman? You don't gotta be the doorman, you can have your own. And still, because of where I had come from, I didn't feel like it was possible for me. But these words resonated with me because here's a guy who comes from exactly the same conditions that I do and arguably has gone through you know, way more adversity. And he said, if I made it, you have no excuse. You need, to take your, you, know, you need to take life into your own hands. And so that was the first time that I had encountered a role model that I felt was putting me on into a whole different spectrum. He didn't shape my perspective. I just got into a different Mindset. spectrum altogether. Right. All of a sudden, the construct of having a job felt ludicrous to me. All of a sudden, that was the moment where it clicked. I was like, oh my God. No matter how much I open this door, no matter how much I smile or how great the suit looks, I'm not getting more than what someone else says I get. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, someone else says that my value is this? Right. And it gives me chills to this day because I was like, man, if we get one shot at this, how, how much of a crime is it to rest your value on what someone else decides it's worth? And it's I knew from that moment, when, that was when I kind of caught the bug. I knew that no matter if I, like I said in the beginning, no matter if you get the W or the L, I knew I had to give this thing a shot. Yeah. And I knew that I, I would be defined by my own efforts. See, most of us, we ponder and we procrastinate and we have over analysis paralysis and we think we have to have the perfect idea at the perfect time, but we never end up taking the imperfect action in order to execute and start to bring it to life and adapt and like become comfortable with the uncertainty and learning from the mistakes and understanding that you know, overcoming the failure is part of the journey. What did you do next that actually allowed you to start to yep. not have someone else determine your value. Right. So I like this question and I appreciate this question because now I feel that entrepreneurship, we're made to feel like entrepreneurship is for those that have a brilliant idea. Right. Like the way that the media packages these stories. Like it's got to be a, an app. It's like, oh, young Zuckerberg, yeah. you know, or this, you know, high IQ kid from wherever. At Harvard. And mind you, it's important to know for the people watching that the reason that they package it in that way is because they thrive off of traffic going to their, you know, whatever, whether it's an article or a video. So they have to sensationalize things. And part of that is the headline, man, they need to write sticky headlines. And so they take all these things that happen very rarely, but then they push it out on their distribution channels to massive amounts of people and people as a whole now have developed this perception that, oh, you need to be brilliant. Oh, that's not me. Oh, you need to come from Stanford. Oh, that's not me. Silicon Valley, that's not me. When in reality, I appreciate your question because entrepreneurship is just an ordinary idea, an ordinary person that has the bravery to act on something that they see in their mind that doesn't yet exist. So on a high level, I'm working a job, yeah. exposed to people who live their lives by their own means and who live their lives doing exactly what they love. In that building, there were professional rock climbers, authors. There was a guy who was a professional dating coach. He got paid to pick women up. You name the profession, people were there creating their own lives. So in a nutshell, I'm constrained, but still blessed because I'm exposed to these paths. I meet someone who cares enough about me because I look like him for him to say, yo, this could be you. He presents me the idea, which was, you know, start a dry clean delivery service. In reality, John, start anything. Start anything and make your own way. It doesn't matter what the idea is to start. You just, you need a vehicle to get you to the other side. Yeah. So that, his, that was what I learned entrepreneurship was getting through to the other side in whatever way that means to you. Right. So, you, on your you're, terms. You, you're a creator, you're a, con, you know, you're a marketer, are you an artist, are you a musician? Whatever that vehicle is for you. That vehicle for me was business. He taught me, hey, sell something. When you sell something, it costs you something and you make the, the spread. So my first business was that dry cleaner. 
But I wasn't passionate about cleaning dirty underwear. I was passionate about mm, taking my life into my own hands. So anyway, I started that business. I started small, convincing doormen to you know, convince their residents to give me their business. Things don't normally pop off like you want it when you start. But, and this is, this is what I was talking about, the entrepreneur needs to have the vision. Because there were so many days on end where I was like, damn, I could see how this is gonna work, but it's not popping off right now. And there's no, I'm in, I can envision the end product, but I don't know how I'm gonna get there. If you know exactly how to get there, you're not thinking big enough. Right. You know what I mean? Now I know exactly how to do it because I've done it before. But in that, in that moment, I was like, how am I gonna make this business pop off? So what does an entrepreneur do? An entrepreneur starts seeding the idea in different places. You start telling everyone that you meet. You start going online. You start, it's, for me, being an entrepreneur is a quality. It's, it's a gene. It's a, it's a way that you approach life. So, you know, you're, you're looking to make things happen that don't yet exist, you know, and that takes digging deep. You have to dig deep. And so, anyway, I'm going around and eventually one of the residents says, hey, John, you're going to, I tell him I'm going to quit my job. He says, what are you going to go and do? I said, well, I'm going to start a dry cleaner, like a mobile dry cleaner. He said, you're going to start a what? He said, dude, I've been in the film and TV industry for the past 25 years and we've been looking for a dry cleaner that can meet our crazy demands because they shoot at three in the morning. He said, what time you get off? I said, 11. And 11 on the dot, he picked me up and this was my big break. And this is what I mean, you gotta keep going and eventually you get an opportunity that you're ready for. You go through enough small steps, eventually, I like to call this the elevator moment. I'm gonna, I have the heart, I'm going up the steps. Eventually though, sometimes the elevator opens up and you, you, know, you try and, and, and run and catch it. Sometimes you miss it and you miss it, you're like, fuck, all right, you take the stairs again. But every once in a while, you catch that elevator. You make it just in the nick of time and it boosts you up 10 stories. Yeah. People like to make it seem like it's luck. People say you gotta be in the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. You gotta be in the right place all the time. If you're at the right place all the time, eventually something's gonna pop off. He took me onto the set of what became my first movie, which was The Wolf of Wall Street. And, you know, I met Leonardo DiCaprio and I met Martin Scorsese, but more importantly, I met the wardrobe supervisor. <laughs> you know, and he was asking me all these questions and he could tell I wasn't ready. But he was in a position where there was no one who was catering to his needs, where he was like, let me get your card and months had passed and my boys were ragging on me because I was bragging that I was going to do Leonardo DiCaprio's clothes and they're like, ah, where's Leo now? You know, everyone's ragging on me. The, the employees in the building, by the way, were like, yo, John Henry Cleaners, yeah, how's that going? Laughing. They're like, yo, you, you know, you're going to make it big, right? Clean, cleaning people's dirty underwear, just ragging on me. And I realized, man, people have nothing better to do but to project their own insecurities onto someone who's trying to do something different. And I was waiting for December 25th, which is a doorman's favorite day, because that's Christmas, that's when you get your tips. And I was the building's favorite. I was gonna make four to $6,000. I was gonna quit, and I was gonna go and do this thing. I got fired December 1st. Oh, wow. And, you know, they said I was a, a conflict of interest, because I was too, you know, trying to get people to, you know, do, do too many things, trying to get them to buy my service. So they're like, no, we can't be doing that. They let me go. And then a couple days later, I get a call, and it's the guy from the Wolf of Wall Street. And he goes, hey man, I don't have any other option. I don't really want to trust you with all these clothes because they're expensive, but I have no other choice. Do you want to, are you still ready for this account? I was like, you bet I am. and I pull up on the scene, and that, that week, we did thousands, of every single piece, if you've ever seen the movie, The Wolf of Wall Street, every single piece of wardrobe that you saw there, the shirts, the jackets, the suits, the, everything, thousands upon thousands of pieces, was entrusted to an 18-year-old kid who had just dropped out of college to try and make this, this business happen, and who had just gotten fired from his job, and who didn't even have a car, and I showed up, and they thought I owned my own facility because I sold it well, and I actually, with my brother, lugged the sacks of laundry through the train and I brought him to my mentor. 
and he helped me clean everything. And, you know, we did a great job. And after that, he was like, you know what? There's a new account in town. If you get them, you're going to be okay for a long time. That, that new account was Boardwalk Empire, who shot in these same streets. Wow. After that, Law & Order, Person of Interest, White Collar, Amazing Spider-Man 2, Ninja Turtles. And we ended up growing, you know, that's when the business really, really took off. Um, and, you know, it's easy to say now in 20 minutes, but there were so many times, man, where you're just doubting yourself, like, what am I doing? I earned my way into that business, held on to it, treasured it. And eventually someone stepped up, made me the all cash offer and I sold the business. And that first W, I felt like I arrived. In truth, if we were to zoom in on that moment, I just had a sense of knowing that you only win when you're willing to do the things that other people aren't. When people are not willing to go beyond that, that space there, that's where all the winning lies. If I do something a little bit distinct and just, just different enough from where everyone else is looking, I'm gonna carve out my own lane. And when you're in your own lane, Man, you, you have, you've created room for yourself to thrive. There's a difference between being able to have financial freedom and actually creating wealth. That's not only gonna be for you and for your family, but really for generations to come. You know, in your legacy. So many of us, you know, we started with nothing. Our families came to this country with nothing. And, you know, we don't really get taught how to really create and, and sustain and pass down wealth. But so many of us have the opportunity to be the difference, not only for our families, but also for our culture. The most important kind of growth is mental growth. And after I've gone, after I went through that win, I realized I started seeing things from a broader perspective, 30,000 foot view, if you will. And you start realizing, man, Maybe, you know, I got a small win, but for every one of me, how many go out there and give it a shot and don't get the dub? And, or how many people have the talent, but don't even get the opportunity to give it a shot? Right. Or how many people are not even exposed that you could be this? So that, those thoughts were brewing in me. And eventually, a few friends and I, we came together and... and we thought, you know what? If no one's gonna put their money where their mouth is, you know, there's a lot of talk about diversity. Yeah. No one wants to actually put money up yeah. into people who come from unorthodox backgrounds, who right. come from a different view of life, right. who don't have, for instance, the Ivy League credentials, yep. but they have a different viewpoint, they have a different way that they do things. Yep. Um, and so, you know, we started writing checks and, you know, small checks to start. I had the chance to work with a really wealthy family, it's a Jewish family, and there I learned the values that have really, really built wealth. And I'm not talking, like, I used to think being hood rich was being wealthy. Yeah. You know, I, I came up, you know, in a space where I seen some of the guys who had, you know, the watches and they pulled up in the whips, and that, when you're coming up, was like, that was it. You're like, yeah. oh, damn, I want to work to that. Yeah. And then as you learn more, you, you start to understand, man, a lot of these guys, you know, they get the whips that they can't afford, they lease it, you know, you can, you get rich fast, you lose riches even faster, right. but you get wealthy slow. You want to build wealth, not only for you, but for your community, you got to build equity, you got to own stuff. And then, gee, I took a hard look at the system and I thought, damn, people of color, we're the largest exporters of cultural value. You look at what generates the most revenue, sports, music, culture, arts, wow. and all that stuff is being produced by us, and yet we own no equity in these industries. Nothing. Damn. That doesn't sit right with me. Like, I have a responsibility to make bread and help other people make bread and build equity. I saw a study, it was fascinating. It said that the majority of wealth that was created, like so certain individuals that had 10 million plus of assets and liquidity, the, almost 85% of them 
got their money through an exit, through selling a company, flipping a company. Some of them had gotten it from trust funds and some of them had come from real estate. But for the most part, people that step into an abundance of resources, it comes from an exit. It comes from building a company from nothing and flipping it in value until you exit. So I thought, hmm, you know, there's a lack of diverse entrepreneurs, but really what there's a lack of are diverse fund managers. So the people that control the money invest in who you look like and who you know. And the majority of capital, like if you think that the percentage of, of entrepreneurs that get funding is small, think about the, the percentage of, of people that are actually deploying the money. Like it's like a sliver of people look anything other than white male. Like that is, gee, that's, that's to me was mind blowing. Like the world is run by like 150 people who control the massive amounts of capital. And when you have that kind of capital, you impose your worldview. You propagate your worldview into the world. You control media companies that shape how people think. Yeah. You control what people consume. So for us, I was like, damn. I started, we started thinking, man, we have to start getting in the game and we gotta start increasing you know, representation in people who are investing. So we thought, you know what? When you think of, of an investor, you probably think of an older white guy. And you know, it's not ill-intended, but that's just the image that's been built into our minds. So we thought, you know what? We're gonna change the face of investing. Like who says that an investor can't look like us? Yeah. Young, fresh perspective, yeah. come from a different place. And when you and I invest, who do we invest in? Yeah. We invest in people that look yeah, like us. For sure. We invest in people that come from where we come from yeah, that have I a different that. take on I stuff. Love that. Yeah. And so that in its essence is what it's about. It's let's give people a chance who haven't had a chance. And to your point earlier, it's good business. Yeah. And so when I look at investing, man, that's really all it is for me is is less control let's get these bags bro what i love about you is you're, you're doing it from a business standpoint but honestly you're super you're you're really conscious to the the blessing that you have to be where you are today and how to consciously continue to elevate yourself elevate your game elevate your knowledge and wisdom so that you can impart that as an example based on your success based on the financial aspect but also so that you can be a leader a role model a mentor to our community and build up our communities and you mentioned nas but you know what really resonated with me was when i went to j cole's at, um when i went to j cole's concert and he stopped mid concert and he plays this video of when swat because he moved into an affluent white area and swat just because he was making music you know, he had rappers and people of color showing up to his house. SWAT eventually from Neighbors Calling came there and literally kicked down his door, raided his home. They didn't find anything. Now, what they didn't realize was J. Cole actually is a wealthy man now. Yeah. He has cameras. He yeah. caught all of it on film. He played the video at the concert. Wow. And what he talked about was, know you know, we work our entire lives, a lot of us coming up we either come from, you know, our parents immigrating here or our grandparents immigrating here, you know, and like we're, we're part of this, we're part of these legacies of our ancestors that have come to America for opportunity. Yeah. And we are now the result of our parents and grandparents and ancestors hard work and hope and will and, and sacrifice we are the result of that so it's only our it's our duty to pay it forward yeah. but what he said was that a lot of us because we haven't had that exposure what ends up happening is we end up wanting to leave to get that mansion and move to those areas that we're not you know we're not we don't grow up in yeah. because we grow up saying oh man i can't wait to get out, out. Yeah. but nobody thinks about coming Bad. back and rebuilding your roots, rebuilding this community. Yeah, and man. the one reason why, bro, I am so thankful that you're here, you're part of this movement, you're part of, you're on the show. More importantly, that you are you and that you are literally the ideal version of what I think is a, a true leader, not just for yourself, but for your for community and as a role model for our generation and for specifically 
our community. So yo, thank you for watching this episode, season four. Subscribe, like, comment. Make sure to check out my boy, John Henry. Right, John, capital. if there's anything, one last piece of advice or message that you want to leave behind, what would it be, bro? Carve your own lane, man. Carve your own lane. You already heard your boy G, John Henry. We out. Peace. Peace.